This is Epicenter, episode 388, with guest Trevor McFedries. Hi, this is Friederike Ernst. And this is Sunny Agarwal. And today with us, we have Trevor McFedries, um, the CEO and founder of Broad. Um, and do of many other things. And we'll talk about all of these in just a bit. Hi, Trevor. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. Before we move to Trevor, let us introduce our sponsors. So our first sponsor for today is uh, Solana, which is a next generation blockchain with lightning fast locks and fees less than a cent per transaction. Uh, scalability is perhaps the single biggest challenge preventing crypto from becoming the backbone of the world financial system. And today, Solana may be the best option we have. Go to solana.com slash epicenter to learn more. Our next sponsor is Exodus Wallet. So if you've been in crypto for a while, you know the phrase, not your keys, not your coins. And it's very important to have a great, easy to use wallet to store your coins and be in control of your assets. Exodus supports a ton of different assets and has great apps for all platforms. Go to exodus.com to give it a try. This show is also brought to you by Paraswap. Paraswap just came out with a huge update that's even faster and more liquid. It's cheaper than Uniswap and comes with a new gas token that can cut your gas fees by up to 50%. Plus, for all our listeners, Paraswap offers 50% gas refunds for the first swap of at least one ETH. Make your trades and go to paraswap.io slash epicenter to claim your refund. So Trevor, you are an incredibly eclectic guest. When I did my research on your background, I had no idea you had done so many things before you kind of entered the crypto scene from the very much from the culture side. Uh, side. So I learned that you um, had a football scholarship <laughs> <laughs> and played pro professional uh, football and then dropped out to do music. That, that much I knew. So you were a rapper, right? So I actually, and I should probably clarify a couple of things. I didn't actually play professional football. I played at the university level, which is just below here in the States. And then I actually, uh, I made like beats and kind of DJed for a very long time, including in a group with a rapper. And so I, I wasn't up in front. I've always kind of been the, the nerdy guy sitting behind the computer on stage or in my bedroom. So some of it translates a bit more than the visual you'd expect. <laughs> and um, then, then you became a DJ who was and actually a very well-known DJ. Uh, your, your stage name was Young Skeeter. And uh, you worked uh, with um, incredible people. Tell us about that. Sure, yeah. So I was in a, a group called Swayze. We ended up putting out like a top 10 album. Um, I was all of, I think, like 22 years old. And so my first trips internationally actually were as a part of that rap group. And um, actually it was just, this is a bit of a crypto tangent, I was talking to Arthur from Trust. And realized my first trip to Berlin, he took me to Bar 25, and I had my mind blown, right? And so um, that was in that group. I, I ended up DJing and producing. And at the time in the States, there was kind of this dance music revolution. You know, I had kind of been a part of this blog house, kind of proto-EDM community. And when EDM grabbed hold, a lot of pop acts and other artists were looking to make music like that. And, and myself and a few others knew how to make dance music that sounded like that. And so we started getting pulled into rooms and, you know, working on tracks, you know, with like the Black Eyed Peed producers or, you know, working with pop acts like, you know, Katy Perry or touring with Katy or Kesha. And then I, I made music for like Azalea Banks and Sky Ferreira and others. And so, yeah, lived as a DJ producer for a very long time. And then you kind of exited music for a while, or at least it kind of, it, it got sidetracked, right? So basically, I, I um, saw that you kind of joined Spotify really early on. Yeah, so um, while I was making music, I mean, I became a bit disenchanted with DJing, kind of the lifestyle that started that. I'm, I'm more comfortable kind of sitting in a room all day than being on stage. And, you know, originally DJing was kind of like hiding in a corner in a dark room and playing records. It was perfect. And as it became more and more being on stage and big lights and flames and stuff, I kind of lost more interest in it. Um, and I started producing music and I was working as kind of a manager and producer for an artist named Banks. We were making kind of some alternative R&B stuff. And, you know, while I was working with Banks, I also had taken a job at Spotify, really with the idea of kind of getting off the road and, and being able to stop touring. 
and simultaneously be able to shape uh, you know a better reality for creative people and, and you know especially musicians. And so the, the dream with Spotify always was to try to realize this future where people could have access to all of the music in the world and artists would be compensated uh, fairly. And you know I think you, things have, have probably gone a bit awry since that initial vision. But that was really intriguing to me, and so I helped launch Spotify in the U.S. And then um, you know kind of like probably overcracked a bit and went deeper into technology and left the culture industry a bit more, as you, as you suggested. What was that um, experience like, you know, going f- like, what were like the best parts of like get, you know, going into this like startup environment and what were some of the, you know, parts that maybe you did miss from the older environment? Yeah, Spotify was incredible. I have to say, you know, I had only, again, I, I was kind of thrust into the music industry when I was like 21, 22 years old and it was the only real industry I had known. And candidly, there had been a lot of brain drain in the US. There were record labels that were, you know, throwing off cash like crazy in the late 90s. And by the time we were signed in 2007, you kind of had bottom of the barrel people running a lot of these playbooks. And so, you know, I talked to our, our marketing person, you know, be like, what's, what's, the, what's the game plan? And they're like, oh, you know what? Um, you, you're going to tweet about the album. And you're like, that's, that's the marketing plan and we're going to tweet? Like, I'm, I'm sure we can go something better than that. And then I joined Spotify and, you know, I met all these people who were incredibly bright, had incredible ideas, but also were executing at a really high level. And the cultural disconnect that was probably most apparent to me was this kind of idea of, you know, lean startup and, and iterating quickly and shipping product regularly, talking to customers and then taking their feedback, you know, to heart and making changes. And, you know, and that was so different than what I had known in music. I had basically sat in rooms with artists in isolation for a year plus made a record and then kind of like pushed it into the ether. And oftentimes it felt like pushing it off a cliff where you would just hope this thing would fly, but oftentimes these records would just, you know, flop or kind of, you know, no one would hear them. And so the idea of, of making something quickly, putting it out into the world, getting feedback and iterating accordingly, it felt really radical. And then, you know, looking back on it now, it was apparent that was the status quo for a lot of industries, but in media, it felt really radical. So I tried to apply a bit of that to what I was doing with banks and other artists while I was kind of working with them in parallel to being in Spotify. Do you think that the some of these ideas have seeped back into the music industry now, now that it's like, you know, 10 years later? Yeah, I mean, it's funny. We were just talking online, just tweeting actually about, um, you know, this idea of version control for music. And, you know, uh, seeing, I think in, in uh, Life of Pablo, Kanye had kind of shipped that record when everyone thought prematurely. And he was updating mixes and kind of changing versions in real time. And you, as a result, got to experience kind of different versions of that record as he sat with it. That was really cool to me. I think that to me feels like a really interesting future, this kind of dynamic media environment. Like talk a lot about interactive media and the future of media being interactive. That to me, I think is really compelling. This this ability to kind of create this work that can respond to, you know, socio-political demands or, you know, different cultural contexts. And I think that stuff, people are still kind of reluctant to explore those things because they're really attached to the romantic nature of music or cinema as it was understood in the 70s and I, you know, I'm most interested in trying to explore new design space and kind of push these forms and so that's the stuff that I get really excited about. So when did you leave Spotify? That was 2015 or 16? Gosh it feels like forever ago but not that long ago. Five years. How come you left? It sounds like you crave new things. Um, but <laughs> tell us about uh, wh- what you were looking for when you left. You know, I think uh, I definitely crave new things. And I say one of the things that Spotify did quite well, Daniel and himself is like, you know, a quite accomplished hacker and creator and builder. And I think recognized early on that if you wanted to get really talented, creative people who are also technologists, they need to be able to kind of have side projects and do other things. And so while I was at Spotify, I was managing banks, I was producing records, I was doing all of these things, and it really made it a more sustainable situation for me. I think I left because I felt the organization changing. Um, you know, it was what was this kind of quirky little startup was becoming this big corporation. And there's a gravity to corporate life, and it's hard to escape, even with the best intentions. I mean, even running my organization, as we've begun to scale, you can feel the weight of the corporate life, you know, pushing down on all this culture we've tried to create to push back against it. So that was one reason. The other major reason was I was kind of at a crossroads. I, I knew I loved technology. I knew I loved media. I was turning 30 years old. 
And it felt like I wanted to spend my 30s, you know, really kind of pursuing my life's work and, and, and things that I thought could make the most impact. And I felt like I, if I created my own thing, I'd be able to probably better fulfill that dream. And so I had started thinking a lot about, you know, media at that moment, technology at that moment, where I had seen those two things do the most good. And I recognized that actually I had seen most of that good come from television programs like Will and Grace or you know, the X-Men cartoon when I was a young person or the Jeffersons, which is a, you know, an earlier uh, program in the United States and had seen those programs change the way you know, the United States had viewed people and created a more empathetic or tolerant reality. And there seemed to be an opportunity to kind of explore that idea inside different types of new media, whether it was social media or kind of emergent stuff. And what began to take shape in my head was like, you know, man, in an era where we have more global issues than ever, we seemingly don't have any global narratives kind of pulling us together. If we could create global narratives with global characters, could we address climate? Could we address global economic issues? You know, could we address global pandemic issues? That would be really exciting. And if we wanted to do that, we needed to create characters that could scale like software. And that was kind of the seedling that turned into Rudd. And so while I was at Spotify, I was thinking a lot about that. Um, you know, I was super into stuff like um, Littoral Abaddon, Hatsune Miku, and then, you know, legacy, you know, Marvel stuff, Disney stuff, Pixar stuff, and thinking about where those two might meet with what was happening on 4chan or in IRC or all of these places where smart people were coming together to, you know, form opinions about the world. So so you formed Brud. Yes. Basically, Brud describes itself as a transmedia company. Um, so you already said that basically you, 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 were tr you were aiming to create narratives that kind of pull people together. Can you make that a bit more tangible? So what is it that Brud does on a day-to-day -day basis? Sure. And I think, you know, to make it even more tangible, for context, I talked about a program called Will and Grace. Just maybe some of your international listeners might not know. It was a television program in the States that featured uh, two different gay characters. And when, as you know, there's, there's all this great polling data in America that basically shows Americans' perception of the homosexual community was tied to the ratings of that program. So as that program became more popular, people had more favorable points of view of the gay community. And, you know, people often connect those dots to gay marriage being legalized in the United States. So what I wanted to do was say, man, that was kind of an emergent form that was really nailed and had a big impact on people. Are there other emergent forms of storytelling we could use to kind of share other themes that we felt were important? And one of the things that I'd begun to kind of, you know, rock or kind of make sense of was this idea of narrative living across different media channels and being kind of connected by these characters. So I often, you know, somewhat telling you, but like I, I often speak to the Kardashians, the Jenners, the West, as Kanye West, you know, like the, the most impactful and important storytellers of our generation. They're able to connect these dots from their social media to kind of press aggregators like a TMZ to traditional like linear long form television, like keeping up with the Kardashians. And what you have is this, this narrative that kind of flows across these things in a way that is far deeper than traditional, just like long form film or television, where, you know, if I watch Star Wars, effectively, I can go as deep as Star Wars. But if I watch Keeping Up with the Kardashians, I can then pop into a Instagram post that reflects that, a Spotify song talking about that incident, a YouTube video of them walking out of a nightclub. There are all of these pieces and you have this really deep world you can immerse yourself in. And so the dream for us as a transmedia studio is to kind of reflect that type of storytelling and do it in a fictional way. And so what we see is there's an opportunity, kind of a, I don't know if you're familiar with like professional wrestling here in the States, WWE. I often talk about that as parafiction. It's this idea of telling a fictional story in a place traditionally reserved for nonfiction. And in a world where people infinitely scroll, to see someone get hit with a chair in a boxing ring, we should go, wait a minute, what? Was that real? And you pause and you have to reflect on that moment. To scroll through an Instagram feed and to see one of our virtual celebrities or virtual characters and be like, wait, is that real? <laughs> Makes you pause and reflect on what you're seeing. So really what we're trying to do is to tell fictional stories in spaces traditionally reserved for nonfiction primarily with these characters we've created in the name of building kind of more tolerant and empathetic futures. And that, that was kind of this big, ambitious, hopey, dreamy thing. 
it's now been realized in a bit more of like a modern Marvel or Disney where we primarily tell stories on social. Let's get to our sponsor, Solana. Now, this is a special ad for me to read because I've been a deep supporter of this project since meeting the Solana team back in 2018. I invest personally in the project and my company, Course One, is super deeply involved in the Solana ecosystem, including running the biggest validator. So what's so cool about Solana? Well, we all know that scalability is the single most important issue facing the blockchain industry today. And the Solana blockchain is an amazing solution for it. The network supports thousands of transactions per second with 400 millisecond block times and over 500 validators. The special thing about Solana is also that it's not a sharded blockchain. It's a single blockchain hyper-optimized for performance. So that makes it really easy to maintain composability between all of the apps on Solana so that they work together seamlessly now and forever. The Solano ecosystem is growing at a rapid pace and it's a great place to build your project or just get involved with the community. So go to solana.com slash epicenter to learn more. It, you mentioned uh, the WWE. Um, there's this like concept from WWE that I've heard of called kayfabe, which is like this idea of like, you know, we all sort of agreeing to treat this like fictional thing as real and just for the sake of the story. And how important do you think that is in like sort of, you know, some of the work you've done with Lil Michaela and stuff like where like there's a little bit of disbelief that you have to suspend. But once you suspend that, it becomes way more enjoyable. That's absolutely. I mean, it's a huge part of what we do. And I think, you know, it's not if people will ask me what that word is in my Twitter bio, because I have this, this, this Twitter bio says the K-Fed of K-Fabe. And K-Fed is a reference to Kevin Federline, who was married to Britney Spears for a moment and was this kind of like pop culture flash in the pan. And that's kind of how I'd like to exist, right? It's like this, this pop culture manifestation of this idea of K-Fabe where we can bring people together to collectively participate in this idea that little Michaela, one of our fictional characters, who in her story is a sentient robot navigating Los Angeles, this entirely fictional thing, is real to everyone participating inside of it. Um, it actually becomes a pretty great filter for like boomers as I would, and like believers, as I would describe them. The young people, and the majority of our fans are young people, will often participate in that kayfabe. And Michaela will say, hey, I went to the mall today. And they'll be like, oh my God, I saw you there. I didn't want to say hi. And you'll have some older person to be like, you didn't see her there. She's fake. And they'll be like, I saw her there. Like, you're a boomer. Like, you don't, you know? And I think that kayfabe acts as a pretty good way of signaling you're in this community. And if you don't get it, you're out. And so, I, yeah, I'm, I'm a huge fan of that. I think you often see that playing out in other places as well. Yeah, just as a bit of background. So basically, uh, Sunny and I were talking about this earlier, and neither of us is Instagram savvy. I don't even have an Instagram account. And so basically, little Michaela, for, for those of you who also didn't know her, so she's she's this, um, as Trevor said, this sentient robot that lives in LA, and it's entirely fictional, but she has an Instagram account. She also has a Twitter account. Um, she has a modeling career, a music career. She has a couple of million followers. So how many people does it actually take to be Michaela? So how many staff do you have on Michaela at Brud? Yeah, so we, we, yeah, so we think of Brud kind of like Disney, right? Where we have these characters and these stories that we tell. We're 30 plus people now. Um, you know, a lot of engineering, uh, creative team, production, marketing, kind of operations functions. So we really think of ourselves kind of like, a, you know, the next evolution in a media organization where you know, you, you're building consensus amongst groups of people to, to kind of push your collective visions through this one entity. Um, you know, it, it reminds me often, I talk about headless brands a lot, kind of like the Toby Shore and other internet idea. And I, I'm, one of the reasons I'm deeply interested in this idea is another reason I'm deeply interested in crypto, right? This idea of, you know, having these identities that can be these vehicles for ideas and they can be ideas from collectives. And, you know, we, we kind of have our own little consensus mechanisms internally for what ideas get pushed through Michaela as an entity. But um, I'm, I'm super interested in some of the things we're exploring is how to kind of expand those things to larger groups and to build consensus and to continue to create media with a kind of more inclusive model that would kind of pull the community and the fandom in as well. You referred to headless brands just just a moment ago. Can can you explain what that is? 
Yeah, I mean, our idea of it is is a bit different. Um, you know, really, when I talk about Headless Brain, I'm talking about our character in Little Michaela, where you'll have maybe a writer, you'll have a choreographer, maybe you'll have a fashion stylist. And through Michaela, they have this vehicle where they can push their ideas through it and maybe one plus one equals three. Um, you know, Headless Brands, as other internet and Toby describe it, I think they, they, they describe it more as kind of like decentralized consensus systems where you, know, you effectively have a, a, you know, a vehicle that can make decisions and then kind of push ideas in, in, into the future. Ours is far more centralized than they'd probably describe immediately, but we're hoping to get towards a more decentralized solution down the road. So what are some of the plans of how you sort of aim to do that? Like how, like, you know, right now, Brud really is the one that like kind of drives sort of the narrative of uh, Lil Michaela and the other characters as well. How currently and then how in the future do you uh, imagine that the fans and the audience will be able to interact with it, with the narratives and help shape the narratives? Yes, that's a great point. I mean, one of the things I spent a lot of time doing is, you know, earlier on in my journey, um, you know, J.J. Abrams and Bad Robot were kind of early fans of what we were building with Brud. We got to work out of their office. And I remember kind of, you know, hanging with J.J. and talking about the writing process and thinking about how, you know, and, and learning that, like, you know, people at Disney may oftentimes have to call Star Wars fans to get the most up-to-date intel on the actual Star Wars universe because, the fans are deeper in it than those professionals whose day-to-day lives are to manage these, these ecosystems. And, you know, you look at that as kind of a very literal way of mining fandom. And I often look at, like, data dashboards as kind of being these really, um, you know, it, it, as being an, another, an, an abstraction of that, right? You want to figure out what people are liking. And instead of, you know, asking them directly, you can kind of look at dashboards and interactions and try to infer what they're appreciating and whatnot. So what we do currently is, is largely a bit of both of those things. We effectively have hypotheses and we have narratives. You know, there are arcs. Michaela's story is really that of otherness. It's a sentient robot alone in the world trying to figure it out and make her way. Something that is a reflection of a lot of our internal staff's, you know, uh, childhoods or teenage years. And we'll kind of talk about ideas currently. We'll then kind of you know, discuss them internally, make a decision, hand off that creative to a production team that will make those assets and then ship them. I think the dream would be to kind of start really early on and say, hey, you know, fans, why don't you come into the fray? We're thinking about Michaela turning left or turning right. You know, which one do you think is more exciting? And you could obviously imagine a governance token or something like that, you know, being a pretty uh, simple application for doing something like that. And if you were to solve for that, then it becomes kind of like this global choose your own adventure game where we're kind of pulling fans in on this journey. And some may opt out and say, I don't want to see what's going to happen in the story. Others may say, I want to be a part of the creation. And you allow this kind of medium that was at once like a broadcast medium where you're kind of just pushing things to people to all of a sudden become this like interactive game where you'll have players, you'll have kind of viewers. I'm sure you'll have people that want to attack the game and try to like, you know, pervert the rules to do things. And I think that will be a a really interesting model for media down the road. So that's kind of how we're starting to make sense of it. Let's get to our sponsor, Exodus. Exodus is a fantastic cryptocurrency wallet that strikes the right balance between ease of use, security, and great features. You can get Exodus on the iPhone, desktop app, web app, Android, whatever platform you use. It's a non-custodial wallet, and that is so critical. Because what's the point of crypto if you don't control your own assets? With Exodus, you always do. They're old school and they've been around since 2015. Over 1.2 million users rely on Exodus, so you know that they've stood the test of time. They have support for over 100 different crypto assets. And from within Exodus, you can easily change one different asset to the other. They also allow you to buy crypto with fiat and they even have a great offer where you can buy up to $500 worth of crypto through their iOS app and pay just $1 in fee. So go to exodus.com slash epicenter and check out their wallet. We want to thank Exodus for their amazing support of Epicenter. So I think you already touched upon it a little bit. If you think back on the points you made on Will and Grace earlier, so basically the fact that it really fostered the acceptance of uh, of homosexuals and basically and the incorporation into it, 
I mean, basically, it's been a major paradigm shift, right? So basically, I remember when sure. I was a kid being gay, this was kind of, it wasn't really talked about it. Now it's, it's, it's super normal. So if we look back on this conversation in 10 years, what do you hope the, the shift that little Michaela will have elicited will be? Yeah, it, I, I think, you know, the dream for us is to kind of have these open-ended allegories that can be applied to all kinds of different models or, or situations for hundreds of years. And oftentimes when I'm talking to like new employees uh, about how we approach a lot of this stuff, you know, I often say we kind of think about 80% allegory and 20% kind of like timely response to sociopolitical discourse. Uh, and the reason we do that is, is largely because, you know, if I were to say, hey, like, we want to go 100% encouraging people to write their senators to, you know, change one bill, that, that would probably be like effective and immediately would probably have a, you know, it would pay less dividends long term. Versus, you know, if I were to, you know, what I often do with them is I say, like, you know, the, the reason we do this, if I were to ask you, you know, who are some of your favorite politicians from before the 18th century? They're kind of like, uh, and I have to go, who are your favorite screenwriters or artists or painters? They instantly have names. And that's because Macbeth is as relevant now as it was hundreds of years ago. And you can apply a lot of those lessons to things going forward. And so what we try to do, for instance, you know, in Michaela's story, that, that major arc is really one of otherness, of being this sentient robot, this misunderstood entity who people don't believe to be real, and to show Michaela on a journey to, like, fulfillment or you know, to kind of, like, chasing her dreams. And in doing so, you know, it's something that I never would have expected. You know, we often have, like, you know, non-binary kids from the Midwest who will reach out and say, hey – It's so cool to me to see someone who people don't believe is real, they don't believe their identity is real, winning. Because in my town, no one believes that I'm real or that my identity is real. And I often feel like I can't do the things that I want to do. And so I, that's why we, we try to approach it in more of an open-ended way where it's like, how can we Trojan horse these ideas of tolerance or ideas of empathy inside these narratives that are as compelling as a Kardashian fight or a Logan Paul YouTube or whatever else is competing for attention. And that's kind of the delicate balance. It should be entertaining. It should be juicy. It should be YA and fun. But there can also be themes that resonate. Do you think that having these like fictional narratives will be better at be becoming allegories than like real world? Is there, is there a concern where in a fictional world, like some, maybe some of these uh, characters end up being very... Okay, maybe the way I'm phrasing this is like, you know, imagine there's a little kid and like they're heroes, right? Like, is it better for a little kid to have heroes that are real, that have like, you know, real world flaws and stuff? Or like, does it maybe turn into a problem if like a little kid growing up has these heroes that in reality are fictional and maybe are, and does that set them up for like a miss, a bad view of like the future Yeah, I mean, I think my dream would, would be that kids would have both, right? I don't think it needs to be uh, in, in either uh, situation. Um, I, I often view it through the lens of my own coming uh, you know, coming of age and through kind of like historical. I mean, if you this you know you go back and you read all the myth stuff, we talk about oftentimes like you know who was the first scalable celebrity. You, know, you could argue Christ, Muhammad. You know, those are examples of like narratives and celebrity that have like radically changed the world. Um, you know. In, in, in the UK I often speak to is like often engage with like Silicon Valley libertarians who to me feel like, you know, Batman, you know, they're these super wealthy people who are using their like technological expertise and wealth to impose their will on society. And what could be subconscious, but I often like to believe, you know, that like comic books informed that sense of purpose. Uh, I often would watch X-Men and be like, man, I can't wait to like hit puberty, uh, get my mutant powers because there, there was this idea that like I was different, that I felt different and that, that, that X-Men was a place where that was okay and acceptable and you could use your difference to do a lot of good for other people who were different. And so for me, the answer is like, hopefully there's both. I want people to want to be Michael Jordan and little Michaela. That would be the dream. But um, I, I think as we begin to see you know, what I would call like, you know, the, the emergent spatial computing future or metaverse or kind of this, this interactive layer of our lives uh, kind of push more into our meat space or IRL lives. I'm, I'm actually kind of rooting for IRL or meat space interactions to kind of evolve as a product and get better as a product, as silly as that sounds, to push back. I think people often escape into video games because video games enable the mobility 
and like kind of upward mobility, even just like leveling up a warlock from level one to ninety nine or whatever it is that you don't have in your IRL lives, especially in the states. We kind of have this like neoliberal hellscape where you're trapped in your like ghetto purgatory, and if you can't move up and down, you're like, yeah, I'd rather get into Fortnite and create some wins. And so I'm actually hoping that like you know while we're building our, our kind of virtual instance of like these allegorical tales. But that those will bleed into the meat space and allow people to kind of build out better futures for our IRL, like human lives. Um, and that's a bit of a tangent, but I'm hoping it gets better for all of us in real world meat space. I love this tangent and I think we should definitely go off on it. <laughs> and I think the way to get there is following the crypto path. So you've actually been in crypto or on the sidelines of crypto for a long time. So uh, I read that you've been in crypto since 2013 somewhere. So so tell us what drew you in. I mean, I wish it was really noble, but it was purely speculative in 2013. <laughs> uh, you know, I think the, the reality was I was like, hey, this thing seems interesting and I could probably make a bunch of money on it. And then you start reading white papers and you're like, that's kind of cool. Actually, and then, you know, as you get deeper into media and, you know, at the time I was at Spotify and you were you're kind of grappling with advertising being a large part of this, this, this funding model and like advertising being this original sin of the Internet. And I remember like reading Kevin Kelly Wired style techno optimist media as a young person about how the Internet was going to change everything and bring truth to the whole world. And when I was like, wow. And then you look back on it and you're like, what what happened that that didn't play out? And I, the, the kind of first thing for me was man, advertising perverted the incentive structure of the internet. And if there was programmable money, perhaps that would have looked different. And that was kind of like the very simple seed of like, maybe the internet could look different. And then it, of course it evolved into like, maybe we could just redo the whole internet. Maybe we could tokenize everything. <laughs> you know, most people book flights on travel aggregators to get more options and the best prices for the travel plans. So when you're making DeFi swaps, Use Paraswap. It beats market prices across all major DEXs. And thanks to their network of professional market makers, you'll get zero slippage on your trades. They just pushed a huge update that's even faster and more liquid thanks to a brand new algorithm. It's cheaper than Uniswap, and it comes with a new gas token that cuts your gas fees by up to 50%. It's no wonder MetaMask, Argent, and Monolith all rely on the Paraswap API. So give Paraswap a try at paraswap.io slash epicenter. This URL allows you to claim a 50% refund on gas fees for your first swap of at least one ETH. This offer is available until May 1st, 2021, and refunds will be made every Friday starting April 9th. We'd like to thank Paraswap for their support of Epicenter. I don't know whether this was your first venture into the crypto sphere as, as a creator, but you created this platform called Friends with Benefits. Tell us about that and tell us what that does. Yeah, you know, I, it absolutely was my first venture into crypto as a creator. Um, and, you know, I think it, I was just talking to a friend about how, we, it's, it, you know, we sold a Michaela NFT in November and, you know, I created Friends of Benefits six, eight months ago. And I, I mean, I felt pretty behind, but now everyone's being like, wow, you were so early in creating things for crypto. And I was like, I, I've largely just sat in the sidelines and my friends are doing cool stuff. But I, I was thinking back to a moment, my friend Calvin, who I believe is still the chief strategist at, at Compound, um, he got, we met through trading crypto, you know, like we were just talk about crypto and, and I talk every single day in this small group of friends. He ended up getting married in Los Angeles and I came to his wedding, you know, having only really known him through trading crypto and sat by Robert, um, you know, the, the founder of compound and it was kind of in crypto bear market. And he was just like, you know, what, what do you, you're into crypto. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm like kind of I'm not outside. He's like, what do you like? And I'm like, this this prediction market veil thing seems pretty cool and like there's some like, like maker dow stuff and she's like oh okay so you actually i'm like yeah i'm like actually paying attention as much as i can but it, it moves so fast and so all that is to say i felt like i was extremely behind on creating anything in crypto and um you know created friends with benefits mostly because i wanted to kind of prove out an idea that I had talked about a bunch with some of my friends who were also artists. And that was a lot of them were kind of getting interested in OnlyFans or Substack or Patreon, some of this creator economy stuff. And my kind of sentiment was like, eventually there's going to be, you know, more supply than demand. And there'll be kind of diminishing returns for a lot of this stuff. And at which point you'll have situations where a bunch of writers are like, what if we bundled our Substacks and like, 
and you're like, oh, okay, it's the, the magazine or whatever, like all the kind of like dumb ideas. And so in my head, it was like, wouldn't it be cool if there were more collectivist models of creating media? Because Web 2, for a lot of my peers, has been getting on a treadmill and trying to crank out as much stuff as you can to survive. And if there were a means to kind of distribute some of that workload so that someone could take a vacation or like really do some deep research and think, that'd be exciting. And so Friends with Benefits is a tokenized community. If you're interested, it's fwb.help. And it was born out of a simple idea that social networks are valuable because of the content the users create. And oftentimes those creators don't participate in the upside uh, of those social networks. And so if we created a fixed amount of tokens and we created a gate where you needed to own a certain amount of tokens to enter this discord, perhaps people would come in, create a lot of value, which would make more people want to join, increase demand on a fixed supply equals people's token bags grow. And you have this, this, this reflection of the value you're creating in your token bags. Hack it together in a weekend, spun it up, started inviting my friends. And I think it kind of kicked off with this NFT mania <laughs> a bit. And so we've had a ton of great, you know, members and, you know, we've had a ton of, a ton of interest, which is awesome. Anyone from Richie Houghton to Mike Shinoda to, you know, really incredible, you know, all, you know, Lindsay at Foundation, you know, Jacob from Zora, all these incredible pillars of both the kind of crypto and like media world and the culture world coming together to try to make sense of what Web3 can be for creative people. But Trevor, just to, just to make sure, so basically um, only the people who are inside the gates can, can consume the content, right? Or is the content monetized? That's exactly right. And actually, like, there's a lot of tweet talking here, but I actually fired up a tweet as we were kind of doing it saying, what if I told you some gatekeepers are good? <laughs> and that, that was like part of this idea that like, you know, what if Web3 has these gates, but they're kind of gates that were kind of more thoughtful. And so, yes, all the media and, you know, people sometimes screenshot things and bring it outside of the gates. But for the most part, people are just hanging out in Discord having conversations, sharing interesting links to music, skin care products, uh, NFTs, you name it. It's a, it's a, it's a wide range. So how, how is that different from private members clubs uh, that we have in the, in, in the analog world? I mean, so things like Soho House or, you know, say even a country club or something. Yeah, so I would say the one major difference that I had in my head was that those are often fee-based, right? Where you're paying a fee monthly or quarterly or annually, whatever it is. Really what we're asking you to do to join Front of Benefits is to stake tokens, right? So it's kind of like a proof of stake model where it's like if you hold 60 FWB, you're in. And if at any point you want to leave, you can dump your bags and go. And so it's, it's, it's more of a deposit. And, and basically what, you know, the idea there is that if, if you have, uh, you know, these tokens, hopefully you're going to want to see those tokens or in the value they represent be you know, maintained or grow at least. So you're going to want to maintain this space. And, you know, for the most part, that's played out. We have this space that feels a lot like the early internet to me where I get on a message board and was met with a lot of love and a lot of good faith versus getting in the panopticon of Twitter now and just being met with like a hellstorm of like <laughs> uh, malicious, angry tweets. Um, so yeah, it's been, it's been a really comforting, fun place to be on the internet. So, so what do you think stops people from monetizing their, ex their early exposure to, uh, to, you know, ideas of the in-crowd? Uh, I think, I mean, I, I think people probably do monetize. I mean, we talk up through ideas often and they're then get realized as products, which is cool. Um, you know, people, I ended up actually, this is kind of a very FWB story. Uh, there's a recording artist named Jock Green based out of uh, Canada. And he was saying, hey, I think I want to do a non-fungible token. I'm not sure how I want to do it, but I think I may want to involve my publishing. And in the FWB chat, people kind of talk through a bunch of different ideas He ended up minting, uh, you know, really a loop that he was going to build into a whole song and it would include the publishing. And I was so intrigued by it that I bought it on, on foundation. And I think that's a good example of the kind of things like it's a space where people can come in to like, it's a crypto space that people can, can approach where there's, you know, not a ton of talk about speculation. I think one of the challenges for me in crypto spaces is it's all kind of like moon boys, so to speak asking like when number go up. And this is a bit more of a space where people are like, okay, 
can I tokenize my master royalties? And people are like, well, you know, things happening off chain, you, know, you can get the feedback you need to build the Web3 future you want to live in. So is there a governance model for friends with benefit or of benefits? Or I mean, can I get uh, kicked out for misdemeanor? Or uh, I mean, I'm sure I'm sure there's rules, right? Certainly, yes. Yeah, so it's ever evolving. We um we just migrated to the FWB DAO, and so we, we traditionally had a set of rules that were pretty centralized at, at the beginning. There was volunteer staff. If you you know it didn't approach people in good faith, you'd be met with a warning and eventually be kicked out. We asked people not to be racist, homophobic. All there's a whole set of rules that we had kind of outlined to make it a space we wanted to be in. More recently, we've evolved and we have the FWB DAO. Um, you know, there have been proposals. One of them was for a fundraise. We, we just we raised seven hundred thousand dollars to kind of like hire some full time staff for FWB, and we've established. Uh, you know, so that was actually voted on by our proposal. We've established a host committee. And so anyone who wants to join FWB now gets approved by the host committee. They fill out a simple form, and the host committee will say thumbs up, thumbs down. Um, it's not that intimidating. We just want to keep spammers and, and kind of like bad actors out. Uh, and you know, going forward, we're going to kind of continue to explore what governance can look like and what it can mean both for kind of like URL, virtual stuff, but also for IRL things. I think there's no reason to believe that we won't bring from the benefits to, to the meet space and try to bring people together. And there's like all kinds of meetups already. Members get together at like, you know, restaurants and hang out, but it'd be great to have everyone together in one space and kind of like talk about building the future we want to see exist. So how do you deal with lurkers? Well, that's what's interesting. I, I have to admit, I, I was a lurker and I actually, I found out this morning that I can no longer access the space because <laughs> <laughs> you now you now need more FWB tokens than I have um, and bought when I first joined. So um, uh, that. That kind of gives away part of the answer, I guess. <laughs> That's exactly right. So, um, you know, one of the things that we're, we subscribe to and that we've kind of maybe pioneered for community tokens is this idea of seasons. Um, and I'm forgetting Simon's last name. Um, maybe it's Simone even. Uh, but there was a gentleman who came up with the idea of, of seasons, kind of like implementing similar models that you see in video games to communities or DAOs. And basically every three months, every quarter, we up the amount of tokens you need to, 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 to make, to, you need to join FWB. And in parallel, we have a source cred instance, is this bot that's tracking who's contributing to the Discord chat. And if you contribute regularly, you'll probably get more than enough FWB granted to you to make it next season. And if you're not contributing, you need to go buy more tokens to participate. And so you were you were caught by the you know, season's gate monster and kicked out. But you know this season now you have an incentive to contribute a bit more. <laughs> <laughs> I should, I should. So, so I know you mentioned that you know you, you you're fans of uh, you know the other internet posts and stuff. Uh, there's another one that I really like. Uh, I think probably my favorite one. I think the headless brand is probably my second favorite one, but was the uh, squad wealth one. And so. How do you see some of those ideas applying to like these sort of communities? Would you would you describe this as a squad or is it too big to be a squad at this point? I think the way they defined it is probably too big to be a squad. Um, you know, another so when, when Toby was working on that piece, he made me uh, an early version to kind of like just run through and make some some notes, and it was kind of in the middle of DeFi summer. And I, I, you know, pre at the UB, I was, in, and I still am in a group. It's, it's called Chad Team Six, and it's a bit tongue in cheek. But um, like Dre, RAC, um, you know, like Justin Blau, uh, you know, me from Spank Chain, Amy from Circle, uh, you know, the Blondish, a bunch of kind of weirdos from Crypto Land are in there. And when I read that spe that, that that text, um, it really spoke to the kind of joy that I had being as a part of that group. Um, and, you know, maybe a bit TMI, but I just got out of a breakup as in a relationship and I was getting so much joy and fulfillment out of like sharing alpha with my friends. <laughs> and, and so I think, you know, FWB was probably born out of that, almost certainly is. I would say FWB is a bit bit bigger than a squad. At this point, we're probably a community, but um, we'd like to try to, and that's one of the great challenges as you scale an organization or as you scale a large community, How do you maintain that magic? How do you make it a place people still feel safe to exist and share and learn? And how do you kind of like highlight the best of it when there's so much going on? And that's the stuff that we're going to constantly be tackling. 
How how do you think? I mean, basically, this this kind of naturally evolves into the concept of a DAO and basically gatekeeping and kind of uh, coming up with rules and updating these rules and so on. Um, so how much impact do you think the concept of a DAO is going to have on us in the next decade or so? Personally, I think it's going to restructure a, a large part of of my world, right? And kind of like media world. I I, I largely see. NFTs and Web3 as already restructuring the individual value chain, right? Uh, the kind of creator value chain. Where I, where I see DAOs is in, you know, reorganizing and restructuring the kind of like media organization value chain. And that can be, you know, I, I mean, that can mean Time Magazine. That could mean Vice. That could mean, you know, Universal Pictures. I think the, the, I mean, the idea, I think, you know, people having lived through COVID and working remote, And kind of interfacing in a project to project fashion, to me, actually feels a bit more like the future of work than it always has. Almost what happens in like film now, where it's like you have your core crew and you go take on a project, you go shoot a movie for two months or two years, you come off of it, something else. Like, I think it's works to be more modular. So I think that's gonna be a big part of why DAOs are appealing. I also think that like as we get better at kind of solving for some of the consensus challenges, the kind of like core governance stuff. It's going to be very appealing to like be a part of the decision making and things that you care about, uh, and so I think I've already seen that. And so for me, yeah, I think I think DAOs are going to hopefully. Uh, maybe I should knock on wood because it might not be. It, maybe it's that negative. But I think hopefully it will be this like net positive restructuring a lot of the organizations that we've come to know because you know it's a different world than it was hundreds of years ago when corporations were first starting to take shape. And do you think this is also going to benefit fit, um, creators and contributors? I mean, because often, I mean, in today's organizations, often they are kind of disenfranchised from the fruits of their work, right? Absolutely. And I think some people would elect to continue to stay disenfranchised. I think there's like some safety in being removed from the decision making. And I, I, it's often intriguing to me because I'm someone who loves autonomy and loves to be making decisions and loves to be first through the door, but oftentimes when you're making these decisions, you're met with blowback, right? And I think one of the things that will probably accelerate some of this, some of these DAO things is the ability for DAOs to act as heat shields for people who want to take more risks creatively. Um, and the flip side of that is that like, you know, more, and that's probably like synonymous DAOs, you know, even like, I guess like, um, you know, Metacoban, Troubadour stuff. Like there's, there's obviously, you know, real desire to be, to have like this synonymous persona in this emergent internet. And I imagine synonymous DAOs or DAOs full of synonymous or anonymous characters will allow them to take creative risks they might not otherwise been able to take as, you know, uh, with IDs or identities linked to their real meat space self. So all I have to say, I, I'm, I'm super bullish on DAOs. I think, you know, as people begin to recognize the amount of value that can be created when you mobilize people, not only with network effects, but also with tokenomics and with good governance, you're going to see lots of good stuff get spun together quite quickly. You talked about pseudonymous identities. So is the idea that all of us are going to be multiple people? I have multiple facet facets that are not necessarily connected to each other. Yeah, I think it's going to be hard to manage the reputation of a ton of different identities. But I think, you know, much the same way when I'm speaking at a tech conference, I'm one version of myself. And when I'm like in the rave, I'm a different version of myself. We're going to have, I think, identities. And I, I imagine the kind of like wallets or you can even imagine like multi-sig wallets where we're kind of collective identities that allow us to navigate in different spaces in different ways. Um, so I'd imagine I kind of have like my public skeet.eth wallet which, you know, it, you know, isn't necessarily where I keep a lot of my positions or where I kind of do a lot of like my, my learning, but it's a place where I can store NFTs that represent who I am. And so if I think about my wallet as my public facing wallet as being this identity where people can instantly understand where I fit in the kind of like larger uh, web three world, I, I almost imagine a future looking somewhat like, um, almost like, remember that like the gen score, I forgot which like DeFi, Upstart had like a little thing where like if you had a high enough degen score, if you had done enough, you had enough nonces or like you had aped into enough smart contracts or whatever, like they would let you participate in the, the earlier version of the build. I, I imagine that people kind of doing similar versions of that just individually, well, they'll look at your wallet and be like, oh, wow, like, 
you know, Trevor has a crypto kitty from 2017, so he must have been in the game back then. And you know what? It looks like he has this a NFT poem from an artist that I like. That's really cool. And he holds Rari governance tokens. I love those little 15-year-old hacker kids. You know, like you can start to paint a picture of someone. And I think that's going to be value, valuable. I also will then probably have like wallets that will allow me to present myself in totally different ways. And maybe I'll want to control a more synonymous uh, uh, or participate in a network in a more synonymous way than that way. Where I get really excited though, and what I always talk about as much as I can because someone needs to explore this, is kind of like the emergent opportunity for multi-signature wallets to allow for collective, like collective identities to exist in applications. And, you know, I guess because I just, I remember, I, like, I don't know, I think often about like Takoon or kind of like, you know, collectives of radical writers that are able to anonymously put work together, push it out and make a big impact. It'd be so cool to have a, a collective or a body that maybe no one even knows each other, but they can make decisions with consensus, put things into the world and kind of, you know, interact with an application as a group versus an individual. And I've only ever really known interfacing with applications on the web as an individual. Do you think that like a lot of the software and like tooling you guys use in like some of your characters, uh, like, like Will Michaela will also be used for creating these like you know, taking these new identities, whether they're like pseudonymous identities for like, you know, a lot of people within crypto like to, you know, do self anonymously. And so they use these like pseudonyms. And then also for these like collective group identities, do you think like we're going to see uh, more of these sort of like digital avatars, but like more than just avatars, like be like the personification of these new identities? I certainly think so. I think, you know, I mean, whether it's like, chain link god or like any of these other like bizarre crypto twitter personas there clearly is a desire to establish reputation without it being connected to your like irl self and so i think the tools that we're building will enable people to probably do some of that you know visually via the avatar but that avatar largely will act as a still i think in the immediate future until you kind of have like the voice modulation software that allows people to kind of go you know, one to one. The text to speech stuff is okay, but you lose the intonation and the kind of affect that allows people to connect. And I think we're getting pretty close. Uh, people are doing some pretty impressive stuff uh, that will allow me to effectively speak into this microphone and come out, you know, with something that sounds pretty indistinguishable from Barack Obama or whatever else. And you've seen some of the deep fake stuff, but that again is that that training data is Barack Obama reading his audiobook, right? So it's pretty monotonous. The ability to have that kind of range and that dynamism is, I think, what makes people really fall in love with who you are. And so that's going to be a whole other set of technical feats that will need to be solved outside of what we're building. So most of the uh, Lil Michaela stuff right now, the audio is like you have voice actors to do those? Correct. We've got multiple voice actors. Um, you know, we, we played around a bit and have like layered, uh, especially in recordings, some kind of generative stuff. But uh, for the most part, humans. We like humans. We like augmenting humans. One of the recurring themes of, of this podcast has been ownership and uh, and uh, stake. Broad itself is is a company that's funded by VCs. If you could do it again, w would you would you have VCs again, or would you kind of try to to raise funds via some sort of crowdfunding mechanism, be it an ICO or something else? Yeah, you know, while I, I while I believe that like venture capital won't exist in 15 years, like I just don't think there'll be a need for it. I also have had like an incredible experience with my VCs. Like while I heard 60 no's out the gate, when we found our tribe and our people, they've been hugely supportive. Um, and even in like crypto VC, I think they're kind of so traumatized from fair launch and the kind of anti VC rhetoric. They want to be extra helpful and like extra kind, <laughs> and, and, and so I think it's 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 noble and I think it's appealing to have a mixture. I think it's, it's appealing to me to have a mixture, primarily because I would like again for our community to have upside in what we're doing. That would be the dream um, to have everyone aligned in that way. That said, when you start to link, you know, community with a token price or with things that may in the short term move in a direction they don't like, you can sometimes, 
you may you, you can sometimes yes you, you may have to deal with the consequences of people that are thinking more short term than you'd like to think right and that's the kind of consequences that you've seen like in the American stock market most companies aren't operating on a five year but they're operating quarter to quarter because they need to appease the people that are monitoring that stock price. I would be wary of people trying to build businesses if they had to manage a token price day in day out. I think it's distracting. I think it's it's hard. I think you know even looking at like Uniswap token price, you know they do the airdrop number go up, number go way down, and now you got to think about okay, are people going to like flee? Are they going to you know because of this token price? I'm going to manage this thing, and of course the price returned to where it probably should be, but through that trough it kind of adds this cognitive load that is not helpful in trying to build something meaningful. And so all that is to say, I would like to find a way to maybe split the difference where it's like, I want people to have ownership, but I also want you to be aligned in this long-term journey, not just trying to like swing trade <laughs> my livelihood. Uh, how do you think DAOs can achieve that? I mean, obviously there's kind of, and this is a, a, a bit outside of um, you know my expertise, but where I'm trying to learn a lot. I mean, obviously lockups, I think, you know, figuring out ways to kind of get people to stake and lock up tokens for long term and like weighting those votes more than others. Um, that's also people have already tried to explore. I'm, again, maybe like cheesy humanist interested in kind of connecting a, a human face and a name to a product. Like, you know, I like we were talking about Rari, like. I just figured out like one of the lead devs is like an eighth grader at this LA school, uh, this LA private school. And like, I want those kids to win so bad now. Like he's literally 15 years old and has like $30 million locked up in the smart contracts that he's written or whatever. Like that's so cool to me. That is, that is so exciting. And as a result, I'm going to like defend that project to the end of the earth. And so part of me is interested in seeing people's like faces and names and livelihoods and families and kind of humanizing these products. They aren't just, you know, abstractions of a token price. It isn't all number go up. Like these are people and these are ideas and they are dreams that if realized could be really meaningful for lots of people. And so that is, um, again, maybe the romantic in me, but I like to kind of see the ethereal human stuff met with the kind of uh, technical code stuff as well. You, you've kind of worked with and for projects in the past and are still working with them that in the in in the eyes of a lot of um crypto people doing more bad than good so i mean uh, i mean basically if you look at spotify and um what it's done to artists and how how unlucrative it's become uh, to actually put anything out there uh, i mean basically Lynn Michaela lives uh, mostly on instagram i mean facebook it, it's it's highly problematic How do you feel about kind of straddling that gap? Well, I would say, so the, the Michaela stuff, right? Like, I think Michaela is really a reflection of the creator experience as a whole, right? Like, we're kind of fighting the same fight. We've got a bunch of people working for us, but ultimately, we're creating a ton of value for these platforms that isn't really being flown, flowed back to ourselves or our community. And so you know, partly one of the reasons we're interested in non-fungible tokens and DAOs and kind of figuring out other means of being or ways of being is to solve for that in the hopes that other media organizations can, can you know, replicate it, but also that individuals can replicate it as well. So yeah, it sucks for everybody. Spotify to me was a really interesting opportunity that, you know, I don't think was able to hit the escape velocity it needed to overcome the major label hurdle. Um, and, I don't think Dan would like me saying this, but I think, you know, in meeting like Daniel Eck and folks early on, there was a real dream of getting to a place where artists didn't necessarily need those labels. And at that point, the economics become way more favorable. I don't think that Spotify got there. And as a result, you kind of have this worse. No, no, I mean, the other situation that is, is suboptimal for 99% of actors on the platform. And It's, it's, it's beneficial to the, the major labels for sure. And I think they've done a lot of things to prevent Spotify from getting where it wanted to be. And that is the challenge of a world where 70% of the history of recorded music is owned by three bodies, right? Like that's a real challenge versus you look at even like Netflix, right? Because there are so many different distributors, the economics of that are, are far different. And because there are so many now streaming players, you have a far more competitive landscape and deals that like filmmakers are largely okay with, you know, like it's, it's no longer Seinfeld streaming revenue, but it's better than like, 
you know, falling off a cliff, which is what they saw coming. And so, yeah, not awesome. But hopefully we can figure this thing out. I mean, I would say the internet as a whole, like, you know, in 96, reading about it as an 11-year-old, I was like, whoa, like, you know, reading Bill Gates, The Long Road Ahead or whatever, like, like broadband is going to change everything. It's going to be amazing, this utopia. And then you live through, you know, a, a decade or at least a half a decade of like just such supreme turbulence caused by the internet. that You're like, maybe this was this, was it worth it? I think it was <laughs> worth it. Like it. It was supposed to be a no-brainer, and here we are being like, if I could just turn it all off, would I? Um, so, yeah, here's hoping we can get it right or a considerably better this go-round. Where do, where do you think NFTs are, are going? So, um, Michaela recently published a piece um, on Mura um, saying that she was the original NFT. I don't disagree, but ca can <laughs> you explain? And do, do you think, I mean, basically, if you look at... Um, the recent prices that have been paid for NFTs. Do you think this is a bubble or do you think this is the new normal? A, Michaela loves to throw the pot. B, it certainly feels like a bubble, but it also feels like this kind of like price discovery moment, right? Where there's, you know, it's, if people use a 2017 ICO analogy all the time, but I actually think it's like a decent one. You know, people saw all this unbridled upside and the only question mark is like, how quickly will that upside come to pass? And it took two, three years, whatever. But like when I felt DeFi summer, I was like, man, it's happening. And you're now seeing the kind of like culture Legos emerge as well on the non fungible token side. And so to me, the prices you're seeing are a reflection of A, how much value has been locked up in platforms. Like in talking to friends about how impactful the Drake hotline bling music video was or something, you know, that little dance move, like that is, was everywhere. And the fact that it generated zero for Drake directly, like that, you just, you just have been you've been conditioned to believe that's the way it should be. And the idea that like people would sell a JPEG for seventy million dollars feels abhorrent. But like, he's been creating media for free every day for like what fifteen years or something like that. Like he's built this passionate fan base and audience, and that number to me feels obscene and large, but not probably not too far off what it's worth. And so that, 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 that's kind of how I feel. I think that like uh, uh, largely the aesthetic of the not like looking artwork to me is pretty bad and, and not for me. I think the protocols as artworks are probably more interesting than the actual artworks themselves, but people are starting to explore them in ways that I, that I appreciate. And so what we're trying to do with Michaela, the bread Dow, we'll have some NFT stuff that I can't speak to just yet, but hopefully It allows people to participate in these social and uh, these kind of cultural moments that aren't entirely dissimilar from like an NBA top shots, which to me, I think is kind of like the killer feature of right now to have this, you know, NFTs right now to me are a bobblehead you get at a World Series baseball game that says like, hey, I was a part of this experience. And that's really exciting. And I want that experience to be reflected in my external identity The same way it would be if I went to a concert that I loved and put the poster of that concert on the wall of my house so when people came in, they could say, hey, you were there? And that, that's kind of how I see it. Beyond that right now, I, I don't know that like collecting moments, it, 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 I, I don't know that I've seen anything outside of collecting moments, maybe like Euler Beach or things that are really intriguing. How about like a, do you think like NFTs will kind of act as this community access token. So currently you have this FWB token that's like, you know, it's just this like normal fungible token. It has a funny name and stuff. But like, what if you could merge the NFTs with the FWB tokens where it's like, hey, if you have five of these NFTs, that's your access to it. But like, you know, there's still like this art aspect to it along with the uh, access rights it gives. Yeah, I think people are, are, are kind of thinking that stuff through right now. Um, I like it as, and this is with one, there's kind of like some maturity. I like it. I think right now, fees are prohibitive, you know, minting fees are prohibitive and kind of collecting fees are prohibitive. And I think to get the kind of scale you need and the kind of diversity you need for a community to thrive, it can be challenging. So I think fungible stuff works a bit better here. But man, if I was ferocious or something and, you know, 18 months from now, I had thousands of people who collected my work and I was able to kind of like organize them and kind of like put them in one place. I think that would be you know, kind of like super serve them. 
that's a, probably a pretty great way to build like a, 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 a fan base that can support you for your career. So yeah, I'm, I'm all for it. I think it's, a, it's probably difficult to see through right now, but similar to 2017, you know, you read those white papers and you're like, this is going to be cool. And then it took three years for some of those things to come to pass. I think this will probably feel similar. Are you looking at layer twos? I am. I'm deeply interested in layer twos and layer ones. I think if you'd asked me six months ago, I'd been like full ETH maxi mode and just, but you know, I was playing around in Terra this morning and I was like, this is pretty, these bridges work. And there, there's probably opportunities to build, build specialized chains. And so whereas I still think ETH is going to capture most of the value, there are probably opportunities for, you know, whether it's Polkadot or Near. or, Cosmos, I don't know, like any of these guys. I think there's, there's room for people to do interesting things and to carve out um, niches that make sense, especially with the bridges. Layer twos, um, my friend Matt works at Optimism. I'm super bullish on Optimism, Optimistic Rollups. Part of me, I think, is traumatized by living in Los Angeles, and I kind of think of layer twos as like adding another lane to the highway where there'll just be more traffic. Like, clearly, there's like latent demand. Like, I have my, my gas fee Chrome extension, and I'm just staring at it, waiting for the time to get in. And if all of us are waiting to do that, then maybe when we add this extra lane to the highway, we're just going to like bloat it all again. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm really curious to see how this stuff plays out. It, it's clear that like, you know, the Ethereum Foundation and others are taking this stuff really seriously and looking to solve for both the climate concerns and the kind of fees. And so here's hoping we solve it and soon so we can kill, keep, keep building this cool future. I, I have one last question as to the cool future. So... When, when you talk to techno-optimists and uh, Web3 believers, they tend to say that they hope it's going to make life better for everyone, or most people at least. It sounds like you believe that as well. But by what metric? If you look at, um, I mean, there's different ways of, of measuring the success or the um, well-being of people. If you had to boil it down to a single metric, What's going to change? What's going to make it better? So I think to be clear, whenever people are like, I want this to make things better for everyone, I like, kind of instantly write them off because they're just always trade-offs, right? Like I think ultimately, like you know, not everything is zero sum, but a lot of things feel zero sum and in changes, like change can be painful in and of itself. Um, I should clarify that I'm most interested in creating a better future for creative people, for innovators, people that are like championing new ideas whether that's fashion designs or, you know, vertical farming techniques or protocol level governance, you know, code, whatever it is. I'm interested in those people being rewarded for bringing new things into the ether. And that is why I am bullish and, and optimistic about our kind of our, our Web3 future. I think the idea of provenance, I think, you know, even the characters and the people that are building in the space to me are like noble people who are interested in new and novel ideas and, and visionary ideas being rewarded for being so. The kind of um, what felt almost like predatory, you know, value, like, felt like predatory value capture to me was a reflection of a bunch of like, a bunch of actors who initially have, you know, people's collective best interests at hand moving into kind of Web 2 and saying, hey, I would have gone to work on Wall Street, but I saw that one movie with the Zuckerberg guy and I can do this too and get really rich. What what's fun to me about crypto is that we're in a moment again where the people that are building like really give a shit, and I think that's meaningful. And when you talk to people in the space, they're nice, and maybe they talk to their shoes while they talk to you. But I prefer <laughs> I prefer people that talk to their shoes while they talk to you with the right intentions and like some you know silver tongued you know MBA who's gonna scam you out of whatever you have in your pockets or whatever. And so yes, all I have to say, I'm a believer in Web three building a better future for creative people and for innovators people that want to bring new ideas to us. Cool. I think that's a pretty nice closing statement, Trevor. If people want to find out more about you and Friends with Benefits and Brad, where should they go look you up? Yeah, so um, my my socials are all what.cd, W-H-A-T-D-O-T-C-D, which is a, a hat tip to a, a, a torrent tracker that some of you, your, your, your listeners may know. And uh, Friends with Benefits, fwb.help has all the info you need, fwb tweets on Twitter. Um, and then, you know, for Brud, it's brud.fyi. If you'd like to get a hold of me, it's skeet, S-K-E-E-T, at brud.fyi. 
It's my email. Send me, send me good stuff. Maybe some death threats. I prefer not those. More good stuff than death threats. But I'm looking forward to hearing from you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming on, Trevor. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, the guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.